Okay, let's start. Uh, my name uh, Tatiana Saburova. I'm an academic director of the Russian Studies Workshop in Indiana University, and I'm delighted uh, to introduce this uh, panel uh, today as a part of the critical conversation. Uh, oops, in the critical conversation in the Russian Studies. Uh, Mark, you cannot hear me. Is it the same for everyone? I can hear you fine. Talk okay, to thank you, sir. Something on Mark's end. Okay, thank you. I was really worried for a moment. Uh, uh, so, uh, and this panel today, uh, because uh, in the Russian Studies uh, Workshop, we have a research cluster um, on human rights and civil society in Russia. And as a part of this research cluster on human rights and civil society in Russia, we have a group on disability studies. So that's a great pleasure to have this conversation today on disability and inclusion uh, in Russia in connection with, with human rights. Uh, and uh, before um, we have our panelists uh, introduced today, uh, I want to say that uh, this panel uh, is organized by the Russian Studies Workshop at Indiana University, funded by the Carnegie Corporation at New York, and also co-organized and co-sponsored by the International Lab for Social Integration Research in the High School of Economics in Moscow. So thank you. And it's really a great example of collaboration between Indiana University and High School of Economics in Moscow. Uh, we also, because that it's a panel on um, disability and inclusion, uh, we have to wonderful interpreters uh, to help us to make this panel really inclusive. So I'm happy to introduce Emma and Brian to help us today. Uh, and then um, I, what I need to tell you that if you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to type in the chat. We will address your questions and comments uh, and it's possible, um, but please, you can type your questions in the chat while the conversation is going and we will return to your questions uh, a little bit later. Uh, and then I will uh, turn to uh, a student in Indiana University, Isabella Castilla, who is an international program and Italian program here at IU to introduce our panelists today. Isabella. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Isabella Castillo. I'm a senior studying international studies in Italian, and I'm so happy to um, be introducing some panelists today. Uh, for my capstone, I wrote about culture and autism in Italy and disability, so I'm just really happy to be here and just hear from some amazing people. Um, so first off, I'm just starting to introduce our panelists, and they'll introduce themselves later on. Um, so first we have Sabentla, uh, who has a PhD in anthropology from Rice University. She is a postdoctoral research scholar at Columbia University's Harriman Institute for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies. Next, we have Elena, who is a professor of sociology and head of the International Laboratory for Social Integration Research at National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Next, we have Sasha, who's a PhD candidate in media, culture, and communication at New York University. And then we also have Sarah, who is a professor of anthropology and director of the Robert F. Brian or Brian Brines. I'm so sorry about pronunciation. Uh, Burns. Russian. It's e Robert F. Burns. That's a Burns. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Uh, Russian and East European Institute at Indiana University. And then we have Kira, who is a theater educator and researcher of mixed able theater in Germany and Russia. She has an MA and studied both literature and theater uh, pediology. So. That is all for now. Well, thank you, Isabella, very much for introducing our panelists. Welcome to our audience members. Um, I have really been looking forward to this event for months now. I see many familiar names and faces in the audience, and uh, I know we're all really looking forward to a very interesting and important conversation on uh, disability and inclusion in Russia, diversity and inclusion in Russia, um, global perspectives and local 
global realities. So I'll just uh, reiterate how today's event will go. Um, I'm the moderator. I get to ask uh, some questions and, and, and listen to the discussion among our panelists. And then they will speak until the top of the hour, at which time we will turn things over to Q&A from the audience. As Tatiana Saburava mentioned, you can put your questions in the chat if that is um, helpful for you, if that's the best way to submit your questions. Or um, we will be keeping our eyes open open for folks to raise their hands. You can do so like this, or you can use the raise hand function um, in, uh, in Zoom, depending on what uh, version of Zoom you're using. And we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, take, take questions in order. You can unmute yourself uh, after you've been called on and ask your question yourself. So um, all that will happen around the top of the hour. Um, we will take your questions. So again, thank you to our panelists today and thank you to everyone who uh, is in the audience. So I, I want to start out with, with quite a broad question actually for our panelists. And um, it's about the term and the understandings behind inclusion. So in the United States, I think uh, when we hear inclusion, this is a very broad concept, right? It's an expansive concept. We can think of gender inclusion, racial inclusion, class inclusion, inclusion in terms of um, disability. Um, and I'm wondering in the Russian case, does inclusion have the same expansive kind of reach or when people talk about inclusion in Russia, do they have something else in mind? Um, maybe I'll start with Svetlana Buradina, who I know has done uh, research on this specific topic. So Svetlana. Okay. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Awesome, thank you, thank you, Sarah. And first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers for uh, for organizing this panel. This is such an exciting opportunity to to speak about very important issues uh, surrounding disability inclusion, and I'm sure we'll also talk about exclusion today. And um, and so and thanks for for a great question. I think it's uh, it's very important to actually pay attention to the semantic and discursive. Uh, particularities, uh, as well as resonances with, uh, with broader global discourses. So just to give a, um, a very quick, to situate myself, I have done um, ethnographic research in, uh, in Russia. I worked uh, in 2016 and 2017. This was the years of my uh, field work. And I worked primarily with disability NGOs. So my, um, my, um, my approach to disability inclusion comes from uh, from the NGO perspective, mostly. And uh, another, another kind of uh, important factor is that I worked primarily with uh, blind people with uh, just a handful of wheelchair users, uh, uh, as well as uh, a few uh, deaf people, but I would like to just uh, identify it from the, from the beginning that this heavily affects uh, kind of the, the information as well as um, interpretations of inclusion that I have come across. And so in answering to your question, Sarah, first of all, I'm sure that all of our other um, panelists will, will notice that um, when we say inclusia, and this is, uh, this is the, the Russian cognate of uh, inclusion, very often, and um, the kind of the default uh, ver um, step would be to understand it as disability inclusion. And um, although we definitely are seeing, especially recently, the development of a more of a broader understanding of uh, in, uh, inclusia. But uh, when I was working in the field, uh, inclusia uh, most often, almost always meant disability inclusion. And I think that this is very, very important to, to understand how disability as a minority group, um, uh, how it stands in relation to other minority groups and why disability, people with disabilities became this, mi this particular minority in regard to which we are, um, uh, especially during the biggest part of the 2010s, we've been talking about in, uh, inclusion. But then, um, so what I wanted to, to add to our conversation is the, is the variety of interpretations of, uh, of inclusion that I have come across during fieldwork as well as as a result of an analysis of uh, 
almost about 400 uh, NGO projects that speak about inclusion, inclusia in one way or another. And I came uh, and I realized, came to realize that people, uh, NGO workers, define and practice inclusion in, a, in so many different ways. And NGO um, interpretations of inclusion uh, I, um, are, I do, uh, as an anthropologist, I take all, take all of these interpretations seriously. I do not try to identify which of, uh, which of them is a correct one and which one is an incorrect one. To me, I treat them uh, fairly equally because they all have material consequences. Depending on how people understand uh, inclusia, then they then enact it and and produce very material uh, effects in the ways how people uh, gain resources to some to some forms of a particip participation or what kind of programs they can they can make use of. And so, just to give you a quick uh, uh, overview, which is uh, just really to kind of to map the spectrum of various uh, interpretations of inclu inclusion. I've come across uh, uh, projects that uh, use the words inclusively, inclusive, to speak about uh, just straight up delivering targeted service, services, often rehabilitation services to people with disabilities. Um, I've come across uh, a completely different interpretation of inclusive or inclusively when people speak about organized sociality where people, uh, abled and disabled people come together, interact, uh, collaborate and and um, really engage in some sort of meaningful um, interaction with each other. I've come across uh, contexts that were called inclusively just by virtue of having physical bodies of people with disabilities present uh, in this particular space, regardless of the quality of participation that they have uh, enjoyed, regardless of whether there was improved access to, to services or to anything, or whether this presence meant anything else besides just being a physical body in, in the same space. And um, as well as recently, and I'm sure my colleagues will, will, will speak more about that, I've, I've seen interpretations of inclusia that uh, try to broaden it, uh, try, to, try to speak about the exclusionary experiences of other minority groups and try to, to cultivate um, um, an understanding of inclusion as this a uh, platform for the inclusion of everybody, regardless of their differences. And, and so this is just, uh, I wanted this contribute, uh, my contribution to kind of just map out the very heterogeneous uh, map of various concepts of inclusion that I have come across. And um, I'm sure I'll later have a chance to speak more about that. But we um, just, my last uh, thought I think would be that it matters a lot what kind of resources people have uh, in their regions, in their organizations, from where they are writing and submitting those grant narratives, for example, or are organizing their, their programs. If in some regions, um, the infrastructures of disability support are relatively developed, in other regions, we see almost a complete absence of it. And, and so there people, uh, what I observed, tend to use the political value of the term inclusive or inclusively to, to gain access to more resources to develop very basic uh, accessibility uh, or disability infrastructures. So I think I'll pause here and, and give a chance uh, for other speakers to, uh, to also respond to this question. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. I'm so uh, grateful for that contribution to help us orient um, ourselves in this in this discursive field of inclusia and I'm also really glad that you brought up the the issue of regional um, differences in Russia and how these things might play out in different regional contexts that is an important point I want to come back to but first I would like to turn to uh, Yelena Yarskaya Smirnova Yelena you are the director of the International Laboratory for Social Integration Research and so I'm wondering how do these discussions and these ideas about inclusion play out in the research that your laboratory is, is doing? Um, how do you engage with these questions on a daily basis? Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, well, uh, the term inclusion is now a very popular 
Dr. Svetlana said uh, uh, both in uh, social policy discourse and uh, discourse of non-governmental organizations uh, and also researchers, uh, more and more researchers, scholars are doing uh, research, publishing uh, articles, uh, books, uh, uh, first of all, of course, uh, related to uh, the issues of education, but not only. Uh, uh, for example, our um, uh, our university, our laboratory, uh, let me share with you the site of our lab, uh, is called Laboratory for Social Integration Research, and we do uh, several projects uh, uh, related to the issues of inclusion and diversity. Um, for example, uh, this uh, research of human potential, we do uh, uh, the, the field study now, uh, uh, conducting uh, qualitative in-depth interviews with um, HR managers of uh, business uh, companies in Russia, both uh, international and the Russian uh, businesses. Uh, uh, asking them about uh, the issues related to inclusive employment, so to say. First of all, uh, we focus on people with uh, uh, different abilities, uh, disabilities, uh, uh, different needs, special needs, uh, but uh, the next step will be also uh, to include uh, issues of migrants uh, in this uh, project. Uh, and uh, we, we will also, uh, we plan to conduct um, a big survey uh, in May, June uh, 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 about this issue. Um, so the, another big uh, project is uh, concerned with inclusive education in post-Soviet uh, countries. Uh, in um, now we have uh, done, we collected the data in 11 countries of post, uh, former Soviet uh, Union, uh, asking uh, parents uh, of children with special needs, uh, parents of their classmates and their teachers uh, about their experiences, uh, different problems they encounter. Uh, we asked, uh, we wanted to, to do this research not only about children with uh, health impairments, with uh, mental uh, uh, impairments or some other impairments, but also uh, about children with uh, a different cultural background, uh, migration experience. But uh, in many countries uh, of this region, uh, it was not possible. Uh, the, the, our partners uh, said it was not possible to raise this issue in, in the research. Uh, they also do, um, I don't know, maybe I shall talk about this later. Uh, we do um, an interesting project with uh, a museum uh, of modern art garage, but I think I will tell about it a little bit later. Uh, so I want also to uh, say a few words about um, um, how public discourse is uh, changing uh, uh, concerning this uh, issue. Uh, let me show you some examples. Uh, for example, uh, this, um, um, just a second. Uh, this um, picture is uh, done, it, 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 this is a poster made uh, of um, a picture uh, or, or drawing made by uh, artists with special needs uh, in a special uh, um, workshops uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, uh, and uh, the question is posed on this um, poster, uh, why do we need inclusion? So the, the project uh, was uh, concerned with uh, the opinions or uh, bright uh, messages uh, of uh, very famous public figures. For example, Newton Federmesser, uh, who is uh, a founder of uh, uh, the first uh, hospice uh, in Moscow, Hospice Vera, which means trust. Uh, uh, and then she says that uh, she says about inclusion uh, in, in very wide uh, sense, in very wide meaning. Uh, 
uh, we also have a survey um, which uh, shows that uh, the uh, attitude of uh, people uh, of uh, people in Russian society is changing. Uh, not only the attitude, but uh, uh, um, in relation to what people answer in the surveys, they also change their activity, their actions. Uh, more people uh, say they help uh, uh, children with disabilities in their families. Uh, they also say that uh, they um, consider uh, the, friend, the society more friendly now than before. But at the same time, uh, about 40% of uh, uh, Russian citizens uh, surveyed uh, last year um, say that they are against inclusive uh, inclusion of children with disabilities. Uh, so we see also some uh, very negative reaction uh, uh, in mass media. Uh, some journalists uh, uh, publish articles with hate language uh, and uh, th there are public scandals uh, associated with these uh, publications. Uh, and there is also a negative, uh, recent uh, negative uh, public reaction towards um, the case of uh, Lida Moniava, who is uh, director of the first Russian children's hospice. Uh, she took uh, a boy, uh, adopted a boy from the hospice, uh, the boy with uh, multiple profound disabilities. Uh, and uh, she took him uh, everywhere in the, for for walk with, in the park, uh, to the swimming pool, to cafe, and also to school. And uh, many parents were against, and they even said they they will not uh, any longer support uh, uh, charity. Uh, they they will not uh, give uh, charity uh, to, to to her hospice. So this uh, I wanted to show you this um, uh, contradictory uh, situation in, in public discourse and in public opinion concerning the inclusion. Thank you so much, Elena. And um, I, I think, you know, you pointing out this kind of backlash that efforts um, towards greater inclusion for um, people with disabilities and others with um, kind of diverse um, characteristics is really important. And it's actually a great segue um, because I know that Kira and Sasha, our two other panelists, have been very uh, involved in um, helping uh, bring attention to the really important case of the intersectional artist, Yulia Tsvetkova. So um, since we're on this topic of um, diversity and thinking about some kind of really negative backlash that we've seen in Russia to um, efforts to promote diversity, um, let's turn to Kira. And Kira, I'd love to, to have you tell us about uh, Yulia and her work and, and the situation right now. And I'll just point out for the audience that uh, Yulia Tsvitkova, about who you'll learn a lot more from Kira and, and Sasha, is an intersectional um, artist. So Kira. Yes, thank you for this opportunity to tell the story of Julia Tsvitkova because after the case of Julia Tsvitkova, I think our inclusion and diversity um, and we are, as inclusion community, we are in the state of emergency. I feel me so, because the case of Julia Tsvetkova um, is in a big um, invisibility for people who managed inclusion, I would say. And because her work uh, is not seen like um, inclusion work. Uh, that's why I ask me, um, see the inclusion, do we see inclusion like political space? Uh, it is a question for me because um, if we um, doesn't protect this person and this person is intersectional artist, theater director, um, fluid activist, human rights activist, um, LGBTQ activist, woman rights activist, and this person is neurodivergent person. And she wrote uh, a lot of about it, but uh, there was no reaction from um, 
inclusion community. And um, it, is a, it is a pity because this person um, is now in the state of emergency, emergency and she faced six years uh, in prison for, for her inclusion work. Um, yes, and um, that's why it was uh, a question for me, uh, what is inclusion in Russia? Is it political space or not political space? Why we try to see inclusion not together with political space? Because inclusion, it is political space because political, it, it is something which is personal. It is a concre uh, concrete person with its needs, uh, I would say beautiful needs. Um, and if we speak about it, not in the terms of academic language, it is, it is about love and acceptance. And it was the work of Juliet Svitkova. Um, but we have a big problem. Inclusion is uh, like everything in Russia, centralized. It's a centralized concept. It's managed um, mostly. Um, it's managed. It's, it's managed mostly um, by privileged, non-disabled people. It's true. Um, and now I think um, it's. It's like, yeah, it's like a state of emergency. We have these people from self-advocacy community, for example, like Julia Svitkova, but her work is not seen like inclusion. But what she did, it was um, political, political acting. It was a risk because inclusion, it, it means to take a risk. If we see inclusion not only like uh, the work with, um, I use identity first language um, because I'm also a neurodivergent person and I use um, identity first language, it's very important for me. That's why I say disabled people, yes, yeah? that's why I say neurodivergent people. Um, what I wanted to say, um, yeah, that we did not see the work of this self advocacy. Um, community and uh, we, uh, we don't appreciate this work because um, self-advocacy communities like for example the work of Julia Svetkova and her mother because it was not only work of Julia it was like uh, this family ethical and aesthetical way of being inclusion was like ethical and aesthetical way of being of this family from the beginning, really from the beginning, you can um, read about it because her mother is also a neurodivergent person. Um, and um, Julia see inclusion not like only work with people, with, uh, with disabled people or only with neurodivergent people. She see inclusion like, um, intersectional work and it's really very complex because if we see inclusion like intersectional work it means yes we take a risk because um, we understand that inclusion doesn't have limits but our um, state politic politics yes says inclusion has limits for example no gay propaganda yeah um, and so on, but it, it's not inclusion. We cannot do inclusion and we have to say it, we are in a state of emergency. Right, so the, the limits of, in, of inclusion are, are one thing that, that um, the case of, of Yulia Tsvetkova really uh, yes. brings up. Not only the limits of inclusion, uh, her work, um, is not seen inclusion. It's a big problem. Mm -hmm. I try to write about it, um, for example, in terms of social culture. And uh, we have this um, um, now this uh, kind of theater, social theater. And it comes also from uh, the work of, um, with disabled or neurodivergent people. 
that's why it's really very difficult but because for this community she is not enough artist for example for another community for i don't know for feminist community she is not enough feminist for um, inclusion researchers community she is not enough researcher she's uh, she she made practical utopia she made a new ethical reality in the city Komsomolsk on, on Amur, and her project was really very intersectional. It was work with um, women, uh, it was work with LGBTQ community, it was work with children, um, with diversity, uh, children, I don't know, with, this chil uh, with um, neurodiverse, uh, neurodiverse children and neurotypical children. And um, also, it was self-advocacy work in her um, Facebook or contacty writing. Thank you, Kira. Sasha, did you um, have any follow-ups that you wanted to mention about Yulia? Uh, and I apologize. Yula, Yula, Yula. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, sure. I'm uh, super grateful. Yeah, I'm super I'm glad that I'm yeah. speaking after. Um, I'm sorry, Sasha. Sasha. The sound is, there's a really the bad is, reverb. There's a really bad reverb. need to turn off one of the type. Okay, let's try right now. Do you guys hear me? Much better. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm really glad that I'm speaking after all the previous panelists because I think you guys mentioned important points. So, first of all, the fact that, uh, as Svera um, mentioned, that um, a lot of times uh, inclusion is understood as kind of a ready made thing when just the physical presence of a person with disability it may be considered as an inclusion, right? Um, which is the person who is invited after all the roles have been ascribed, after there is already the scenario of, of performance or movie or any other public event. Um, and um, as Kir was mentioning, a lot of inclusion in Russia is um, centralized, so it's done by able-bodied, privileged people um, who um, invite disabled actors into the, kind of the secondary roles, right? When, again, if that's an, like an inclusive performance, um, the director or producer would be most often um, able-bodied and um, would just uh, ask a disabled uh, actor to play the role already kind of pre-established, right? So um, that's that's a big problem, I think. And the same in research, right? Even we, all, all, all the people in our panel mostly are able-bodied. So it's, um, it's, it's kind of a, this talking from the privileged position, unfortunately, right? And I know we are all great scholars and the situation is changing bit by bit, but it's important to um, really um, to include uh, people with disabilities at these first stages of a development of a project or performance or a, a research. And um, also the other, the other thing is that inclusion has never existed in, in Russia so far, right? So neither in the post-Soviet nor in the Soviet time. So we don't really know what it is. And we really need to kind of uh, understand that it's not a ready-made thing. It, it only can be produced collaboratively in this process of, con in these conversations uh, with people with disabilities. Um, and it should be individual, individual, right? Every time it can be something different depending on the needs and like mixed abilities of, um, uh, of, of, of the people in, in the team. Um, and yeah, just a couple of words about Yulia. I'm 
I think Kira is the best person to talk about Yule because she's been help, helping immensely um, Yule and her mom who are both neurodivergent. So uh, Anna Khodriva, Yule's mom is, um, has dyslexia and Yule has dyslexia and self-diagnosed Asperger syndrome. Um, and um, as, as Kira said, their work is truly intersectional. So it kind of goes beyond those limits of including people with disabilities, but um, Yule's work, and I, I'll talk a bit later about, with me and Kira will talk about a bit later about her projects in particular, but um, it was truly intersectional. And that's why when she was, um, she, she got four di different chargers uh, for last two years. So starting from March, 2019, um, the first charge was related to so the, the first situation when FASB and the local authorities started to intervene into her um, activities was um, the performance called uh, Blue and Pink when they were planning to show um, this theater performance um, at the local festival of activist art called Saffron Color. So, the police uh, began to interrogate the participants um, since they were, um, yeah, they were they were thinking that they would um, be that they would find propaganda of non-traditional values in it. Um, and in fact, the title of this performance was suggested by one of the young um, participants of the uh, actors of the theater, and the, the the play itself dealt with gender stereotypes, right? The fact that guys need to wear blue things and girls need to wear uh, pink things. So it, it actually dealt with these gender stereotypes. And um, yeah, so th that's when the interrogations of children started and a lot of those interrogations happened um, outside of their, uh, their parents' presence. Um, then she was um, accused of Mm, distributing pornographic content. And I'll talk a bit later about the project that um, that provoked this reaction from the government. Um, and yeah, since, um, since uh, November uh, 2019, um, she's been um, under this, the, the, like the official legal uh, case against her started and she was under the house arrest for three months um, and paid several um, quite big fines, like her family had to pay these fines. Uh, and now uh, since March, like the official trial start has started. So it's, it's kind of the, the very time when a lot of public support is very needed. And um, when I think I'm very grateful for this space to, uh, to, to devote it to, in part, right, at least to um, kind of dissemination of this knowledge about Yuda's case and the importance of her case for the whole uh, business of inclusion in Russia, right, and, it, and kind of widening and deepening the sense of inclusion um, uh, in Russia. Yeah, I think I, I'll pass my turn now someone else. Thank you so much, Sasha and Kira. And I would ask you if you have um, links you'd like to share with our audience about Yulia's case. Um, I know there's a petition that people might like to sign. If you could put those in the chat, that would be great. Um, Svetlana, I wanted to turn to you um, as a follow-up and see see if you have some some reactions to, to what's been said and, and and contextualizing again inclusion as we've been talking about it in a more kind of expansive um, fashion. Thank you, Sarah, uh, and thanks to both uh, um, Elena, Kira, and Sasha for um, for all your contributions. I wanted to to uh, briefly comment uh, and kind of build on uh, what Kira and Sasha were, were saying. This absolutely the depolitization uh, of uh, inclusion is is something that I definitely have observed myself too. 
those, um, and you can see it in, in many ways. Uh, so in NGOs, in the work of NGOs, this comes across that um, one of the major uh, funding sources that provides support for inclusive projects uh, does not fund uh, politi so-called political projects. They are supposed to be uh, um, kind of uh, removed from the from the domain of the political, and instead um, they should uh, they should serve as uh, families. They should uh, provide support for youth, or so they should be categorized as something removed from the political. And um, and then on the other hand, we also see another um, another kind of risk factor. Um, is that we all know about the uh, foreign agent law uh, that uh, requires everybody, uh, NGOs who received foreign uh, donations from foreign donors and who uh, does who do political activities. It's important that those two go together um, uh, to report themselves as uh, foreign agents. And that significant this label significantly complicates the work of, um, of NGOs. And in my experience, those uh, NGOs who did uh, uh, who uh, did not um, do what the state recognized as political activity, so did something that is depoliticized, um, did uh, were still able to receive uh, foreign donations, foreign money, and um, and so what Kira mentioned about the fact that uh, inclusion is is is, is depoliticized, I absolutely see this and. And I also see um, Yulia Tsvitkova's case as, um, as such a strong case that shows us how intersectional work and how detached from the concept of diversity is the Russian concept of inclusia. And uh, I completely agree with, uh, with what both of, of you said. And, it is, um, and I think for me, it also ties to to this thinking about disability minority, uh, the minority of people with disabilities as this depoliticized minority that is made unthreatening, whereas other minorities are made threatening to the to the society and to the state. And we see uh, it reflected in the legislation, such as uh, anti-gay propaganda law, or you see uh, unfavorable regulation of uh, pe uh, people who with migration experiences and things like that. Uh, and so I think this is very important to, to, to emphasize that those initiatives that do receive support, they are removed from uh, and kind of detached from a more systemic political critique that uh, Inclusia does. Inclusia has this potential, but, but in Russia, uh, the kind of the how successful uh, the pro the inclu uh, an inclusive project, especially for NGOs, is heavily depends on on the NGO's ability to argue that this is not a political critique and this is not uh, kind of a, a critique over the existent uh, way of things. I just wanted to add this um, to our pre previous speakers' contributions. Thank you, Svetlana. Those are such important points. I really love how you just brought into the spotlight the, the, the fact of how decoupled the, the notion of inclusia is from diversity. And I think that's a great segue actually to, um, well, first I wanted to see if Yelena Yarska smirnova want, wanted to, to say anything about this decoupling of kind of inclusion as it's conceptualized and practiced in Russia today, a decoupling from like a really broad notion of diversity that goes beyond um, the issue of, of disability. How do you see this in the research that you're doing, um, the NGO work uh, that I know you're really closely um, connected with and, and so on? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, very important, and uh, you, uh, all uh, my colleagues who talked before, uh, mentioned correctly that it's decoupling and also depoliticizing. Uh, at the same time, of course, we see um, many different developments uh, going on at the same time from. Uh, different uh, sectors of the society. Uh, of course, there are 
uh, I can say I, I did not calculate it, but the majority, I, I can guess, I mean, from, from just what I have read and uh, seen in internet, uh, in publications, the majority of the research into inclusion uh, is devoted to the issues of disabilities. Uh, recently, uh, several years ago, uh, also the issues of uh, um, autism, uh, autistic dis disorders uh, or spectrum of autistic uh, disorders uh, also uh, came to the uh, field of uh, attention of the researchers, uh, not only, of course, healthcare researchers, but also social scientists. Uh, uh, who started working more closely with practitioners, also with social work uh, domain of practice, training, and uh, research. There are also there is also development of uh, um, assessment uh, evaluation, uh, so to say, not research but uh, practice of evaluation and also. Uh, the need to evaluate, uh, although it is related uh, maybe um, uh, also to neo-managerialist um, uh, ideology and, and uh, values and uh, goals, it also gives, uh, um, it also pushes the development of uh, reflection, uh, especially when uh, the evaluation uh, criteria um, do not only um, Mm, uh, are not only related uh, with uh, some quanti quantitative quantitative uh, criteria of uh, uh, costs and benefits, but also with some values, uh, including this uh, value of diversity and inclusion we are talking about. And of course, it is very difficult to assess and to evaluate, but uh, I, I can I observe the attempts uh, in this field. Uh, we also have, I can also show you a little bit uh, of other examples. Uh, we, we see how uh, fast and uh, it is uh, also very, um, um, uh, I mean, I like it very much uh, that uh, business also develops uh, very fast. Uh, uh, we see uh, several consulting and um, sort of think tank and training provide, providing groups. Uh, for example, this is diversity and inclusion consulting, uh, Babat consulting team. Uh, which uh, uh, provides uh, business organizations and actually whoever likes it, wants it, with um, uh, every uh, very, very uh, uh, trendy uh, means of uh, development. For example, storytelling uh, related to diversity and inclusion in business, uh, in, in marketing, in advertisement. Um, we also, I mentioned previously, I mentioned our uh, research into the uh, inclusive uh, employment. Uh, so we meet uh, with um, managers of uh, very big companies, and many of them talk about uh, they, uh, they 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 list <laughs> uh, different uh, positions, job positions. Uh, uh, so it's not only uh, HR. Uh, manager, uh, they, they have uh, four or five different uh, positions uh, who are dealing with uh, sustainability, diversity, inclusion. It's uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, it's, it, it looks very interesting, and and they well, we understand that this is uh, sometimes it, it it has to do with demands of international global community of businesses, but at the same time it goes into Russian reality, and now not only. Um, scholars who are engaged in international research uh, community uh, and not only art community uh, talk and do inclusion. Now it becomes a very interesting uh, practice uh, also uh, spread in, in business uh, uh, and of course in, in state-based services uh, and, and institutions. Uh, we also mentioned um, uh, intersectionality uh, there are several examples of uh, such projects uh, and organizations that do, uh, for example, uh, 
gender uh, crossing uh, with uh, ethnicity, migration experience, uh, also disability. Yes, of course, disability uh, seems to be depoliticized or more like uh, politically loyal or maybe prioritized uh, matter. But uh, if we uh, use uh, an approach of uh, uh, Nancy Fraser uh, and, and other post-structuralist thinkers we can say that uh, let's not divide political and personal, public and private. And then we can say that everything is politicized, actually. Everything is politicized. Well, this is a very politicized example because it, it is a recent uh, feminist festival. It, it is not the first one. Um, it, it became regular and it's of course very, uh, very, very politicized, but it's mainly um, uh, uh, concerned with, it, it is concerned with uh, art practices, performances, and also with uh, academic reflection and uh, uh, public uh, uh, reflection, uh, discussion, uh, and it had a special section I think it was for the first time, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so uh, there was uh, a very interesting uh, preparation to this uh, panel, uh, women with disabilities, discussion panel uh, within this uh, festival, feminist festival. Uh, for example, uh, I was asked by uh, uh, the, the um, organizers and Sasha knows about it. She also asked me uh, if we know uh, some women with disabilities who are also scholars, academics, uh, part of academic community. So uh, there was an attempt to um, uh, break this. Uh, I wanted to say that there was also a trend to social closure uh, in one uh, or several communities that I know about of women with disabilities. Like they would held um, uh, they would um, conduct uh, events uh, open only for women with disabilities. And uh, I interpreted it as a social closure uh, trend. But uh, in this uh, event, in this festival, it was open. Uh, uh, it was possible to cross the borders, so to say. Uh, the just uh, project uh, which uh, also crosses uh, the borders between gender uh, and uh, migration, ethnicity, religion. Uh, they use humor, they use uh, different, uh, very modern uh, communication strategies, such as TikTok, uh, short videos. Uh, mm, uh, sometimes they, 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 they are very, very uh, witty. <laughs> Uh, and also, I would like to mention our uh, project with Garage, the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, we call it Laboratory uh, for the Study of Diversity. Mm, and it has several, uh, it, 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 we now conduct it for the second time for uh, various audiences, for mixed audiences. And it has a very diverse and cross-sectional uh, cr uh, cross program. So we have here a gender and the age and the disability and social class uh, and, and other different issues. And we also uh, discuss and uh, uh, revise the concepts of inclusion, diversity, universality, and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this, these were my examples for now. Thank you, uh, Elena, so much useful. Um, information. There are lots of uh, comments in the chat. I encourage audience members to look in the chat. We will try to get to those questions in a bit and our time is running uh, running short already. It's hard to believe, but I wanted like following up on um, those points that Elena made and, and thinking about uh, you know, inclusion as an active process. I think it was Kira who, who mentioned that in, in inclusion involves doing it, right? I mean, we can see lots of examples of kind of centralized top-down inclusion efforts, 
Um, we can see examples of more grassroots, you know, on the ground experimental inclusion efforts. So I wanted to talk um, to ask Kira and Sasha if there was more uh, that you wanted to say about uh, the theater Merak, um, about Yuli Svitkova's work, um, just to kind of contextualize uh, how Yulia and and um, the, the the young actors that she's worked with have have been doing inclusion and and how that is such an important um, important initiative. Um, and again, we we only have a few minutes left, but but please either one of you, whoever would like to go first. Um, yes, it's a very, very interesting question because if we speak about Yulia Svitkova, we have to say she made inclusion of her own um, because um, inclusion, it was the way of living, as I said. And the beginning of this inclusion uh, was the criticizing of uh, the concept of charity in Komsomolsk Amamoa. And she wrote a lot about it. Mm, uh, she has a say, and um, it's called Not Kind Komsomolsk, for example. Um, and she uh, describes um, Komsomolsk like a sensory hell for her, for example, and also um, as a not right um, project, inclusion project, for example. Um, what could be worse than a lack of help? Some, something that some people pretend is a help. Is now possible to do good in our city. Over the past few years, many organizations, group, groups involved in charity have emerged. I crossed paths with most of the good people of our city, and I can say that there are very, very few real ones. Should I, as an activist, support any civic in in initiatives, or can I speak up if I think there is something else behind good intentions? When will my freedom of speech end and stones will be thrown at me for surrounding my people? But I will try. It's like white saver complex and I can single out the initiatives, the harmfuls, like write a letter to the embryo, a good promotion that sent balance into the sky. Exploitation. Uh, it's the people that try to make money with stories of, uh, with stories of disabled people. Racist. Where did racism originate in Komsomorsk? We have many ingenious peoples with a very difficult fate. And there are those who raise their status as the, as the savior of the village. Ableist, from downright offensive to downright stupid. Starting with verbal abuse of children with CP as an event in support of children with CP. Ending with the project of a playground for children, uh, for children who uses wheelchair, consisting of curbs and pits. Actions against children, because going to the orphanage and bringing gifts and sweets, there is against children. This is to say I'm great and the children have nothing to do with it. Commercial, commercial and grant. When the in initiative was born and died alone with the sown grant, or when under the Guys, how, how it's right? Guys, goose. Sasha, can you help me? How it's pronounced, uh, this word? Guys, guys, yeah. guys, of good, there's an operating commercial structure. So she was, um, she was analyzing the structure, the power structures of the city. Um, before she was starting to make her own projects. And uh, as a neurodivergent person with this experience of marginalization, with the experience of bullying from her childhood, um, with this experience um, to have to be comfortable for another people um, and um, to Yes, yes, she, uh, she understood that 
we are fucked personally and politically. Um, and she wrote a lot of about her neurodivergent coming out, that it was very difficult in this city, Komsomoysk on Amur, because this city was like a dangerous space for inclusion and for complex solidarities. And for this coming out or for this um, accepting for herself, she went to Moscow and St. Petersburg. That's why I say inclusion is something what is centralized. Um, yes, and she understood that um, she has to do diversity culture. And diversity culture, it doesn't mean diversity plus culture. It's diversity culture. And it's a new space. It's, it's a new ethical space. And it's, it's a reality, but we, we don't see it's like reality. We don't see that we are diverse. It's, it's a fact we are diverse. We have diversity. We are a diversity society. And uh, she, she sees it, and that's why I think she made this um, complex project. And this complex project, it's like five projects, five different projects. And maybe um, um, Alexandra um, tell more about it and show examples. Yes, I, I want to use this opportunity to um show some of her, some of Hula's projects so as Kira mentioned maybe the the main the most important um one is theater Mirak in Komsomol School Amur with the children and teenagers um where they were talking about um the things that they want to, wanted to talk about so they didn't have any chief roles they didn't have like, like an official producer uh they all it was a kind of a fluid collective where these roles um, were distributed uh, like according to the consensus of between the people. And the other um, beautiful projects of you include um, these four um, these four initiatives. So one of them was called Kamsamolka, feminisms, uh, feminism of intersections. Uh, I, I catch myself on talking about these projects in in the past tense because the all, all uh, because all four of them were um, initial eventually stopped um, because of the persecutions. But the, the fact that they existed, um, they are kind of the beautiful examples of this inclusivity. So um, Komsomolka is uh, an on, online community. Most of Yule's communities are in the social network of Kontakti, the, the Russian social network. So um, this one was the place where um, Julie gave lectures about women's history, women's art, um, the fights against domestic violence. Um, and uh, her, I think her art is really kind of um, conspicuous in, in this sense. So she was collecting these uh, artworks um, in, in this community uh, and they, they mostly deal with the issue of um, free female um, feeling of, the, of their bodies, of uh, free sexuality, um, uh, issues of like fight, this fight against gender stereotypes like um don't wait for the night defend yourself um and i think a lot of them also deal with um just um allowing uh, ourselves to take space uh in society like um this one i really like um says that I, I'm big, right? I can, um, I can occupy um, the space around me. Um, I don't need to shy, shy away.
We've lost your sound, Sasha. Sasha, включите микрофон. Oops, I think I think we might have lost Sasha. Apologies. Um, okay, and maybe she's coming back. <laughs> Sasha, are you there? I think she's having technical technical difficulties, which is too bad because that was such fascinating work yeah. that you're sharing. Um, well, maybe Sasha will come back on. I'm going to stop her sharing here just so we can. Guess I'm not able to do it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I think my internet connection is just not the greatest today. Um, okay. Maybe I can do it for you. So, Jerry. yeah, yeah, a couple. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, just I'll, I'll finish briefly. Um, so some of these works were uh, bought by the Amsterdam Museum um, to support uh, Euler's work. Um, and the other projects, uh, so one of them is this comic uh, graphic novel about uh, abuse and domestic violence. Um, I, I highly recommend you guys just really, uh, we'll, we'll send the link in the chat to the exhibition and you can directly go to the uh, Kentucky pages to study um, those materials um, uh, like full, more fully. Um, and yeah, and another another uh, like public platform that she created uh, was called Community. Um, uh, it's also like an intersectional space where um, people where uh, they were giving lectures, discussions about um, civic activism, about a lot of a lot of things were devoted to issues of ecology um, and. Pollution of uh, Komsomolsk on Amur, um, also about issues of racism, ableism, as you guys see. Uh, here are the actions in the city that they did. So basically, collecting garbage um, and making uh, works of art out of it in Komsomolsk. Um, yeah, this was the action called Komsomolsk is not a, a, a garbage dump. Um, and yeah, the last, uh, the, 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 the last, but also the main kind of project, which was the official cause of um, launching the court trial against Yulia uh, was this collection of uh, artworks about vagina and a clitoris and uh, female uh, embodiment and sexuality in general. So, um, if you if you guys go to the Kentucky page, you'll see um, uh, you'll see all of these works, which are mostly not Euler's works, but just her reposts of um, other people uh, kind of abstract uh, works about vagina uh, and uh, human human uh, female body in. Um, in general, and as, as you see, the, the name of this project, um, the Vagina Monologues, is um, kind of an echo of um, another um, a, a famous play by uh, Eve Ansler, um, which was uh, also like a series of monologues, a performance which consisted of a series of female monologues about issues of um, their sexuality, um, domestic violence, um, gender stereotypes, etc. So, and and that 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 was the the official kind of the first cause why um, Yulia was charged with um, with distributing pornographic content um, to start with. Um, okay, I think I'll stop at this to give you guys also a chance to to talk.
Thank you so much, Sasha, for that. I'm necessarily short, but uh, very informative um, overview of what, what Kira so ably called uh, diversity culture that, uh, that Yulia has worked uh, to create. And um, please, again, you mentioned that you would drop some links in the chat for our audience to, to, to look at all of these um, sites and exhibitions and um, articles uh, as well. So thank you in advance for doing that. Um, it's hard to believe that we have already uh, run up uh, over our time of an hour for this stimulating discussion. And I do want to honor our, our promise to the audience to, to take questions. I'll start with one that has come up in the chat. And then I will also ask audience members um, it's, it's a little hard for me to see the gallery view, but I'll try. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand either uh, using the little raise hand function or uh, just go ahead and uh, turn on your video and raise your hand. We'll call on you, but I'll summarize a question from the chat, uh, actually combining two questions. Um, audience members are, are wondering uh, what our panelists' recommendations are uh, for helping create a more inclusive society, I would say, for, for promoting diversity culture in Russia. And a second part of that question is, is there anything that researchers can actually do? You know, how can researchers, how can scholars influence policy? So sort of a two-part question, very difficult question, but uh, who would like to, to offer some thoughts on practical solutions, what scholars can do to influence policy, what recommendations you have? Is that your hand, Sasha? Or are you just fixing your hair? <laughs> okay, uh, Svetlana and then Elena, please. Thank you. This is a great question. And I would like to also uh, echo what um, I, I believe everybody touched on this. I don't remember who exactly of the panelists mentioned, but uh, first and the most important thing is to bring people with disabilities themselves to for not as clients uh, or not as consumers of, uh, of inclusion, inclusion themed programs, but as designers, as architects and as uh, decision makers. Um, to um, to not to not only come uh, uh, and uh, participate in this what Sasha uh, termed as ready-made inclusion, but instead uh, in in designing what what they should be, partially. And I'm saying this with a lot a lot of um, kind of room for a critique of this. One way of how it has been done, uh, but um, I'll 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 voice my critique a little later is through. NGOs, because um, a, a good number of people with disabilities had access to uh, designing those uh, NGO projects themed in inclusion that um, I've worked with as well as that I've observed. However, I am saying this with a lot of uh, room for critique uh, and there's uh, because the first for my main major critique is that who gets to design those those projects and what kind of uh, people with disabilities, what kind of other privileges they have. And so we need to really take into account the internal differences within the disability community themselves, seeing how some people have more access and have more um, chances to to kind of to uh, conform with this normative idea of a rehabilitated successful uh, person with disabilities and uh, other people don't have a chance to, to conform with this, with this uh, norm. So we need to account for that. We also need to account for the fact that um, doing inclusion, inclu uh, I'm, I'm mixing Russian and English, sorry. Inclusia as, um, as project, uh, instead of a systemic kind of uh, integrated strategy also has shortcomings because it, it creates this kind of islands, uh, uh, sort of uh, temporal and spatially isolated context uh, of, uh, of inclusia and then it, it raises the question of, of how we can uh, going back to Kira's, uh, Kira's concept of disability uh, culture how do we how do we uh, transcend the, this uh, these boundaries of precariously funded uh, islands of inclusivity 
and and how do we and and how do we actually institute it at the level of of social values uh, of social practices and uh, providing opportunity, real functional opportunities for people with disabilities to act as decision makers. So um, I, I'll just um, cut my, uh, my contribution here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Yelena? Uh, yes, uh, and uh, actually I agree with Svetlana very much and the uh, museum uh, 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 acts uh, as a real agent. Uh, I mean, uh, many museums, especially big and uh, located in capitals, but not only in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but also in many other regions. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is uh, even, uh, I would say, uh, inclusion movement uh, among art uh, uh, institutions, uh, cultural spaces, art spaces. And the uh, uh, leaders of these movements uh, are uh, promoting these values and they're doing new uh, interesting projects and actually they promote new, new values and new practices and new services uh, in their fields. Uh, for example, uh, uh, today, uh, this um, morning, uh, I uh, participated in a working meeting with uh, Garage uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, and representative of uh, VAC Foundation. Uh, 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 and they, they, we were talking about uh, Museum Mile. Uh, this is a new project uh, in Russia, in Moscow, that will uh, uh, connect uh, several biggest uh, and largest and uh, most famous museums, uh, Tretiakovskaya Galleria, uh, Pushkinsky Museum, Garage and VAC Foundation, VAC Museum uh, of Modern Art. Um, uh, and uh, uh, now people with disabilities will uh, uh, make a decision based on their own expertise, assessment of uh, the, the track, the, the way, uh, the paths uh, 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 that they, they will go together with uh, 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 representatives of this project and with uh, sociologists uh, to try uh, this way out, to try to talk about it, to make photos. Uh, to do it. I mean, and this is only one example. There are also other examples. Sasha uh, is uh, leader of such a, 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 a small group uh, act of activists of people with disabilities who are uh, testing uh, the accessibility of Gorky Park. Uh, so there are uh, like, you know, uh, movement from grass, as you say, Sarah, uh, and also from this um, art uh, community. Uh, actually, we can say it's uh, maybe business in, in art sphere, but it's also state-based uh, state based institutions. I, I think also the uh, uh, inclusion, inclu inclusion culture will uh, gradually be uh, formed through education through uh, but not only through formal education uh, you asked sorry you asked also to uh, think about books uh, children literature and i found actually uh, <laughs> quite a lot of um, books uh, uh, that are recommended uh, as books on special needs and inclusion. Uh, and there are, uh, I don't know, many, many such books. Uh, I only selected here books written by Russian uh, authors, but there are also lots of translations. Uh, so uh, um, uh, there are also, of course, uh, uh, inclusive schools uh, and uh, mm, uh, there is a uh, law uh, on R education Russian Federation that uh, uh, defines inclusive education. Uh, and of course, there is a very gradual process to bring inclusion culture, to build, to form inclusion culture at schools. Uh, but we see uh, a very bright examples and the discussion is going on and also now new generation of children uh, is being socialized in, in such schools uh, with more or less uh, uh, good experience of inclusion. Uh, so I think uh, the situation will change gradually. 
not only through, through schools, I wanted to say also for theater, for example, and the children of Yulia theater are all the manifest of the future. Um, Alexander, maybe you can show it. And in this manifest, uh, they wrote about inclusion and diversity. Yeah, we actually were um, thinking of reading just parts of it because I think it's it's a really nice way to maybe end the discussion uh, since the kids, um, the actors uh, and teenagers from um, from the theater wrote it uh, themselves. So um, that's that's the theater as they visualize it, the theater of the future as they want it. Um, how they how they imagine it to be. Um, so there's, there are several points um, that they find important. First of all, is democracy in the youth theater. So theater should not be under um, state restrictions or any restrictions from above. Um, equality and solidarity with the theater community. So theater can be organized in any space. Um, this also includes school rooms. Uh, and this doesn't diminish its value or make it worse than a state theater. Um, mutual respect should be fostered among actors and no bullying should be tolerated. Um, themes and theatrical forms that are being used can be basically anything. Theater can be anything. Um, theaters should foster an environment in which children would be interested in directing their own plays. Teachers should listen to the children and respect their needs and ideas. Children can practice the plays everywhere, including outdoors. There should be more free theaters that will have performances on any topic. The director is not more important than actors. Actors and actresses can choose their own roles and how to place them. In theater, everyone is equal. Everyone takes part in discussing and thinking through the theme and the script. In theater, a collective of people decides everything. It's a, also a community. Children should be involved in all processes as much as adults are. Costumes, scenery, dra dramaturgy, directing, technique. Children's and youth theaters should be supported by the participants themselves, their parents and the residents of the city because theater is always for the city. Um, the theater provides for a comfortable space for all children, teenagers and young adults. Space and work must be organized in an inclusive way. All people, regardless of gender, sex, health, and your diversity, social status, and background can be part of the theater. The theater takes into account the different abilities of each actor. The age of the actors is not important. Theaters must not tolerate any form of ageism or ableism, racism, and other forms of discrimination. Um, yeah, and the last point is that um, grand theaters should support independent theaters because those are more vulnerable. The community should be able to react as quickly as possible and spread information on the pressure that is put on any of the theaters. The cases of attacks and harassment need to be dealt with, with officially and legally. It's necessary to make public statements and talk about the situation in social media and to provide these events with wide publicity. Um, we encourage all youth theaters to study the Convention on the Rights of the Child and other legal documents so that in difficult situations, one can identify or exclude possible violations of one's rights by referring to such documents. We believe that's an important step in the formation of civil society. Um, so I, th I think that's a, a, a brilliant conclusion uh, to what we've discussed so far because the, the, the children speak themselves about breaking those boundaries between what is and what is not a theater, about directors and actors again, um, about um, any kind of gender or race um, or a, uh, uh, ability stereotypes. So um, that's, that's really, uh, I think they put it in a brilliant way, way this wide um, diversity-based definition of inclusion, um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Sasha. I agree that it is a, a, a really terrific way to, to wrap up our panel today. Um, I want to uh, thank all of the panelists for your time, your expertise, your passion. Um, I believe there is a way for us to uh, collect the links that you have generously offered in the chat and send those to everyone who uh, registered for the event. So we will endeavor to do that. And uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, there is a link to a survey that would be helpful for the Russian Studies Workshop team. If you could please uh, follow that link and fill out a very, very short survey. And I'll draw your attention to another uh, event that we have coming up in two weeks. I will put a, a link to this event in a second in the chat. Uh, we are having a film screening of the documentary film Voy by director Maxim Arbugayev. Uh, this film uh, tracks the um, Russian blind Paralympic soccer team uh, and their quest uh, to uh, win the European Championship. We hope that the director, Maxim Arbugayev, uh, will be available uh, to introduce the film and have a Q&A with the audience afterwards. And we do plan, uh, I'll, I'll mention that the film is in Russian with English subtitles, and we do plan to have audio description of the film in English for those who would find that helpful. So again, we'll, uh, the, the link is in the chat. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, really thank our uh, ASL interpreters, Brian Tyler and Emma Loveland. Thank you so much. Uh, for your work this afternoon. And uh, I applaud all the panelists, Svetlana Boradina, Kira Shmiryova, uh, Sasha Kurlinkova, and Elena Yarskai Smirnova on all the wonderful uh, work that you are doing, both in terms of your scholarship, in terms of your activism, um, your community building work and your efforts to, to help uh, create a diversity culture. So thank you all so much. And uh, thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. Thank you for organizing it. Yes, thanks for organizing it. And thanks to all the panelists and the audience. This, this has been great. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>